Welcome and thank you for joining us here today for the fourth day of the Columbia Symposium on Vaccines and Global Health. I'm Linda Freed, I'm the Dean of Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health and have the honor of opening this very important session as part of this five day long symposium series, which has been an opportunity to explore the history and current status of COVID-19 vaccines. Our theme today is government and industry, focusing on COVID-19 vaccine development strategy and implementation. This is a critically important and of course appropriate theme considering the absolutely remarkable accomplishments of the past year when government, industry, and if I may add academia partnered in the race to develop vaccines for COVID-19. That we are on the verge in the United States of approving a third vaccine 12 months after the first recorded COVID-19 death in the United States is of course an extraordinary and unparalleled feat. And of course, many other vaccines globally have also come to fruition or are completing testing right now. This collective feat builds from and capitalizes on decades of science for society with an eye to what the public's health needs and, uh, and how, how we can solve that. In that work, we are of course always aware that public health is a collective action problem. And in fact, it is defined that way. The actions we must take collectively to accomplish the health of the public. This is why certainly at Columbia's Mailman School, we have over our history been committed to strong collaborations with local state and national governments and with industry to um, create the knowledge that is needed and ensure that it's implemented maximally to improve the public's health. Um, and we're he here today proudly joining with these immensely accomplished leaders and scientists um, to consider what has been accomplished and where we need to go. At Columbia's Mailman School of Public Health, we're quite proud of the work of NIH, of scientists around the world, and certainly the scientific contributions of our own faculty over the years in the science of infectious diseases and of controlling pandemics, both around the corner and around the world. As a school which is 99 years old, established just in the wake of the Spanish flu pandemic of 1919, we have been leaders for a century in contributing to improving global health. Our faculty to the present work in over 100 countries of the world in bilateral partnerships of equity for the public good. And whether the markers of accomplishment are pandemic preparedness and response, prevention of chronic diseases, or mitigating the health threats of climate change, the impact has been consistently significant, positive, and sustained. And this past year, of course, has demonstrated the importance of all of our collaborations more than ever. During this time, uh, I know that the Columbia Mailman School has continued to contribute to the accomplishments of the year, whether it's um, the leadership by Dr. El Sader, and I'll say this to introduce her, since the early days of the pandemic, where ICAP at Columbia, which she leads, has advised leaders in 24 countries in Africa, Asia, and the Americas, building on nearly two decades of experience and responding to the world's most significant public health challenges and harnessing its longstanding partnerships with ministries of health across the globe. In partnership with stakeholders in each of these countries, ICAP is directing its teams to create firewalls of detection, prevention, and response to stand between the spreading virus and the communities in its path. And of course, our Center for Infection and Immunities tests um, for SARS-CoV-2 led to a significant expansion in diagnostic testing capabilities and was judged by Rockefeller University last summer as a first in class contribution uh, with many more that have arisen since. Today, um, we are very delighted to welcome the eminent scientists and leaders who are joining us um, and to welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Anthony Fauci. 
for an afternoon that I'm confident will provide insights into vaccine development from the industry, NGO, and national perspective. And, and now it's my pleasure to hand the microphone to Dr. Wafa El Sadr, Director of ICAP and the Mathilde Krim Amfar Professor of Global Health at Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health. Dr. El Sadr has been instrumental in shaping responses to COVID at the global and the local level. And here at our university, we are personally grateful to her for her leadership in leading the university's public health task force, which I also serve on and guiding us through this pandemic. Dr. El Sadr will provide introductions for each of our guests. Wafa. Thank you very much, Dean Fried, and thank you for your leadership of the school and your strong support uh, of, of all of us in terms of uh, responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. We very much appreciate your consistent uh, uh, support and leadership. Uh, I'm honored to moderate the session today, and we'll start by introducing our keynote speaker, Dr. Anthony Fauci, who um, in reality uh, needs no introduction, but nonetheless, uh, just a brief introduction. Dr. Fauci is, uh, has been the long-term, long-standing director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, NIAID, at the U.S. National Institutes of Health. And he oversees a, a very large research portfolio focused on both infectious as well as immune-mediated diseases. Um, he has contributed uh, enormously to advancing the science of, uh, of prevention and treatment for infectious diseases, as well as also for various immunologic diseases over, the, over many decades. He also was a, an important and principal architect of the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, uh, the program that has really saved uh, millions of lives uh, uh, among people living with HIV and has played a pivotal role in the US uh, COVID-19 response. Dr. Fauci. Greetings, everyone. It really is a great pleasure for me to be part of this symposium hosted by Columbia University on vaccines and global health. As you can see from this title slide, I will be talking about the role of NIAID, NIH in COVID-19 vaccine development, but also this will be talking about contributions by a number of other people in the scientific community. As many of you know, the NIH research agenda on coronavirus disease, namely COVID-19, involves a wide variety of approaches with therapeutics, diagnostics, natural history, basic research. But what I'm gonna to focus today in light of the theme of this conference is vaccines. Now, the primary US government vaccine development stakeholders are not just the NIH or NIAID, but the Department of Defense, which also contributes to basic and clinical research on candidates, advanced development by the ASPR, the Assistant Secretary for Prevention and Response, BARDER, as well as the FDA and our colleagues at the CDC. First, let's take a look at where we start with what we refer to as the vaccine construct itself. The vaccine construct can be divided into two major components. First, the vaccine immunogen, and then the vaccine platform. Taking a look at the vaccine immunogen, there really is a very interesting story as to how we got to what we feel is an optimal immunogen that has led to the successes that I'm gonna to talk to you about. So in order to do that, one needs to, uh, 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 essentially maybe spend a minute or two on the history of the NIAID Vaccine Research Center. Um, I've told this story many times, but it really tells you a lot about the influence what leadership can have on the scientific endeavor multiple years later. At the end of uh, 1996 in December, associated with the discovery of the CCR5 co-receptor, which got a lot of press at that time, President Clinton and 
Vice President Gore invited me to the White House to discuss this aspect of the very fundamentals of basic research on HIV AIDS. And in that discussion, he asked me, understandably, why we don't have a vaccine for HIV when, in fact, we've known about this disease since 1981 and we knew about the virus since 1983, 1984. I explained to him the importance uh, of collaboration and cooperation among people from various disciplines, which is sometimes difficult to do, and that a vaccine center might be actually something that would get us in that direction of people of different disciplines. He then did something which was extraordinary. He made a decision there that he was going to put in the resources right away for a vaccine research center. And then literally five months later announced at Morgan State University that he was going to establish a new AIDS vaccine research center dedicated to this crusade of putting an end to the HIV AIDS epidemic. And those of us who've been involved in research on HIV AIDS knows of the great progress that has been made, but still we do not have an AIDS vaccine. But the story and the plot thickens here because what we did was put together a number of individuals, many of you know these as colleagues and friends who were representative of multiple disciplines, structural biology, virology, immunology, vaccinology, uh, clinical trials, all together in the same building, working with each other and collaborating. One of these individuals was very much involved in the structural biology of HIV. And in fact, today, what's happened because of the extraordinary level of the science that we have been involved in the development or attempts at developing a number of other vaccines. Now, getting back to the individual who was involved predominantly in structure-based vaccine design was Peter Kwan. And Peter, as many of you know, who have been involved in HIV AIDS research, pushed on the structure-based vaccine design and did a number of very important studies on showing that if you get the right conformation of the structure of the HIV envelope trimer and you stabilize that, that is one of the first steps towards the development of an appropriate immunogen to induce broadly neutralizing antibodies. That is still an evolving story. But there were other investigators in the vaccine research center who were interested in other diseases, including respiratory syncytial virus, which many of you know is a global burden of morbidity and mortality with over 33 million people in the world suffering from acute lower respiratory infections, over 3 million hospitalizations, and between 66 and 200,000 deaths, and it actually causes 6.7% of deaths in children aged one month to one year globally. And also, it is responsible for the triggering of the development of asthma in individuals who get hospitalized with this disease. Now, what then happened is that the person interested mostly in respiratory syncytial virus was Bonnie Graham, also circled in red. And the fact that they were in the same building, talking to each other every day at lab meetings, running into each other in the hall, they decided to cooperate and to collaborate. And the fundamental base of knowledge of Bonnie Graham, together with the extraordinary talent in structure-based vaccine design of Peter Kwong, led to the collaboration, which in fact made it clear that the post-fusion of the F protein, the form of the F protein of RSV, actually did not bind neutralizing antibodies, whereas the pre-fusion form did. And it was decided to use the pre-fusion form as the appropriate immunogen. But in order to do that, since the pre-fusion form was not stable, would be to stabilize it by selected mutations in the molecule, which led to the beginning of a very important success story, which is still ongoing in the structure-based vaccine design of RSV in humans. 
And I'm sure over the next couple of years, you're going to be hearing a lot more about that. However, this concept then spilled over into coronaviruses, because when we had mares, the same thing happened, was we try to make a vaccine early on with SARS, but that essentially burned itself out by good public health measures. But the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, the same approach was worked on by designing a prefusion spike antigen to be the immunogen for the mers cov vaccine. But then along came what we're dealing with right now, SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. And to make a long story short, that accumulation of knowledge over many years and the work put into being able to get the optimal immunogen, in this case, the prefusion form, which would have been unstable, but the uh, mutations that were induced in the spike protein in its prefusion form made it stable. And as a matter of fact, as you'll see in a moment when I get to it, of the six vaccines and three separate platforms that the NIH and the federal government, mostly the broader aspect of the federal government, had been involved in, in either the development of the vaccine itself, as was done with Moderna, or the facilitation of the clinical trial of many of these five out of six of these have used some manner or form of this prefusion spike protein, which was developed at the Vaccine Research Center by Bonnie Graham, Kizzy Corbett, and their colleagues. There's another component of that is the platform that's used. And as many of you know, over the years, a variety of different vaccine platform technologies have been perfected from genetic immunization with DNA and now most recently and most commonly used now is mRNA vaccines, viral vectors, including ADNO, we'll get to that in a moment, recombinant proteins with and without adjuvants, nanoparticles, virus-like particles, a major advances in the science of vaccine platform technologies. And in fact, if you look at the, the array of vaccines that are part of Operation Warp Speed Development. As I mentioned, there are six companies, three separate platforms. The mRNA for Moderna and Bio uh, and Tech Pfizer, the ad, the chimp ad for AstraZeneca, the human ad 26 of Janssen, J and J, and recombinant proteins and adjuvants with Novavax. And I'll get to it in a moment. Sanofi is, is involved but several months behind the others with regard to their development, but all of which are involved with the Operation Warp Speed development. Let me just switch for a moment to clinical trials, because this is something that really is, is really quite important. We developed, the federal government did, and the NIH particularly, and this is a paper that was written by Larry Corey, John Muscola, Francis Collins, and I, on what we call the strategic approach to COVID vaccine design, where we had a harmonization of protocols to be able to get the multiple vaccine candidates that we were supporting to have some sort of harmonization. For the most part, common data and safety monitoring board, common uh, immunological uh, parameters to be measured, uh, common primary and secondary endpoints to go down the line. And here they are right here. Um, this is really very important because as we develop these vaccines, and some may come before others, uh, if you get to the point where one may not be able to go completely through the uh, vaccine efficacy component of the trial, there could be some bridging since there's a degree of commonality among these. Now, one of the things that shows what investments years ago in a different disease, i.e. HIV AIDS, in the clinical trial network that we developed domestically and throughout much of the world, which really served us so well in the proof of the best usage of first single, then double, and then combination antiretroviral therapy, which has really transformed the lives of HIV infected individuals. Many of these sites 
vaccine, ACTG, prevention networks have been part of the COVID-19 prevention network. And in fact, in that regard, something happened that was really historic, historic in its timing and in its impact, is that from the time the sequence was made known on January 10th by the Chinese on a public database of this new novel coronavirus, that within five days, the vaccine development program began for one of them, but for several others. In this case, it was Moderna. 65 days later, a phase one began. A phase three in July 27th, both Moderna and Pfizer started then. And then what happened was in 11 months, in December of 2020, we had the first vaccine doses in the arms of individuals of a vaccine that had been proven in a 30,000 person and 44,000 person trial to be highly efficacious and also safe. And here we are with the results of these on the slide, a version of which I showed you just a moment ago. 94 to 95% efficacy in the mRNA, both of which have been given in EUA. On the 26th, one day from now, the uh, VRPAC will meet the FDA advisory committee on data that Janssen has just released yesterday, namely the 72% efficacy in the United States, 85% efficacy overall with a very good efficacy against advanced disease. And then there are other candidates here, which at various times from now will have enough data. The AZ trial is ongoing in the United States and in a few weeks likely, we will have an examination of some of the uh, endpoints that were being part of the, of the protocol. So we'll have to stay tuned for that. Long story short of all this, that the scientific breakthrough of the year of 2020 was decided by Science Magazine to be the development of COVID-19 vaccines. Another very important recognition of the importance of years of basic biomedical research. Let me just switch very briefly to the issue of vaccine distribution, that when in fact the vaccines were clear that they were effective and safe, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, which is commonly and consistently deals with and consults with and advises the CDC to assign to different phases of distribution of a vaccine in which the supply clearly does not yet meet the demand. As many of you know, the different phases that have been signed are phase 1A, which is health personnel and long-term care facilities, phase 1B, which is frontline essential workers and elderly, phase 1C, more elderly and people who are younger who do have high risk conditions and then other essential workers and then finally virtually everybody else who's not in the priorities that preceded them we are dealing with something that is really important the issue of vaccine hesitancy which we know has been a problem that long antedated the situation with covid 19 this is a recent poll conducted by Kaiser Family Foundation that there are still people and a substantial proportion who have somewhat a concern of things like long-term effects, side effects, uh, maybe not as safe as they're said to be, not as effective as they're said to be. There are very good answers to each of these. And that's the reason why we have to have a lot of outreach, particularly to many of our minority populations because of the understandable hesitancy that they may have in a situation that has historically been not very good for them. In order to engender confidence and enthusiasm about getting vaccinated, here is a picture of President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris receiving their doses of vaccine. And in fact, at the NIH, Francis Collins on the left and I in the middle, and then Secretary Alex Azar receiving the vaccine in the NIH in Missouri Auditorium. Again, 
to show the confidence and the safety and the efficacy. There's some follow-up thus far, and there'll be a lot more as the months go by. The safety profiles are really quite reassuring for both the Pfizer product and Moderna. If you look at the MMWR that came out a few days ago, that uh, of the 14 million vaccine doses that were administered in the United States from December 14th through the 13th of January, there were no unusual or unexpected reporting patterns. Clearly, there's been an issue with anaphylaxis. It still remains a rare occurrence. It occurs in individuals predominantly, but not exclusively, who have a history of anaphylactic reactions. The, uh, a group has examined this during the period of time shown on this article. And the incidence of this is about four to five cases per million for Pfizer and about two to three cases per million with Moderna. Now, the issue of vaccines and community transmission, the concept of herd immunity, make it clear we do not know what the percentage of population that needs to be vaccinated in order to establish herd immunity and what role prior infection together with vaccine plays in this. The estimate is that it's somewhere between 70 and 85 percent, making some extrapolations from what we know about measles, which we know having a 98 percent effective vaccine together with one of the most transmissible viruses that you can imagine has probably 90 percent or more would have to be the cutoff for true herd immunity. But there are many challenges to this. And again, we won't know what it is until we reach it and then fall behind it, as has happened with the situation with measles in certain parts of our country, particularly in the Orthodox Jewish population in certain sections of New York. The challenges are the hesitancy that I mentioned, the unknown role of vaccines in actually preventing transmission, the spread of new variants, and the possibility of waning immunity. The real question is, does it stop transmission? There's been some important hints about this in that the uh, Lancet in February published a study from Spain, from Catalonia, which showed that viral load could serve as a proxy, as a proxy for infectiousness in very many ways as we've clearly shown with HIV AIDS, that viral load is absolutely related to the efficiency or not of transmission from one person to another through the sexual route. And even mother to child transmission in the perinatal uh, area, it's very, very clear that if the mother's viral load is high, there's a greater chance of transmitting it to the baby. And then in a preprint server, uh, it was shown in a study from Israel that, in fact, if you look at breakthrough infections of vaccinated people versus infection of unvaccinated people, the viral load in those who were infected and vaccinated was substantially less than those who were infected not having been vaccinated, which tells us that this is likely the case, but we have to do some cohort studies. Now, the impact of viral variants on vaccine effectiveness is clearly a problem that we need to address. There have been a number of variants that I'm sure many are familiar with. The UK one, which is now clearly in the United States with more than 45 states showing this. And in fact, um, this is something that fortunately is very well handled by the vaccines that are currently being used, the Moderna and the Pfizer and the J&J &J also. One more problematic is the B1351 in South Africa. We do have this in the United States and it diminishes the capability of antibodies induced by the vaccines about five fold, but not to the point of completely eliminating the effectiveness of the vaccine as shown by studies in which severe and advanced disease leading to hospitalizations and death were actually protected by the J&J &J vaccine that was tested in South Africa. And then finally, the P1, which is in Brazil, similar in some respects to the South African uh, uh, variant. Of note, 
We have variants in our own country, particularly the recently 429 that was seen in California. This is something we are really going to have to address. So what are the ongoing and planned priorities of these vaccines? Namely, the development of next generation vaccine candidates that are specific for variants and increases the breadth of protection. We need to do safety and immunogenicity studies in pregnant women and children, in compromised hosts, in highly allergic individuals. And we need to assess the ability of vaccines to prevent transmission, as I mentioned just a moment ago. And finally, on this last slide, something that I think is apparent to everyone as manifested on several publications, including the ones shown here, is that if you want to call it the holy grail, I guess, but we do know that we must ultimately go for, and the time is now, as shown on the first paper, to develop some form of a universal corona vaccine, having had experience over the last 18 years with three pandemic or pandemic potential coronaviruses, the one we're living through now, as we all know, sadly, having led to the death of 500,000 people in the United States and over 2.5, close to 2.7 million people worldwide is something that is has to be avoided in the future. And one of the ways that we can do that, hopefully, is to use all of our scientific capabilities to develop a universal coronavirus vaccine. I'll stop there. And again, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to make this presentation. And thank you very much, um, Dr. Fauci, for this excellent presentation that I think will serve as a fantastic foundation for our discussions later on, and that I'm sure our speakers will build on some of the concepts that you have uh, provided us with, some of the insights you provided us. I'm going to move on now and introduce our next speaker. And our next speaker is Dr. Uh, George Gao. And Dr. Gao is the director of Chinese Centers for Disease Control and is also the Dean of the Safed Medical College of the University of Chinese Academy of Sciences. Uh, Dr. Gao is a, is a very uh, renowned uh, virologist and immunologist, and he has uh, been very interested in research focused on enveloped viruses, uh, as well as on molecular immunology overall. He has received numerous awards and recognitions for his, uh, his research, as well as for his service. Uh, Dr. Gao. Okay, thank you, uh, Wafab, and uh, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, whenever, wherever you are. Here in China, I'm based in Beijing, it's 1 a.m. at the moment. I'm very pleased to be invited to give a talk here. So, give you 10 minutes, I'm going to talk something about the epidemic very quickly in China and the organization of vaccine R&D and vaccination in China, and progress of vaccine development and clinical trials, and uh, implementation of COVID-19 vaccines in China. Very important, AEFI surveillance, that's very important. And also, I'm going to explain a little bit about China's contribution for the COVID-19 globally, how we can um, assist together with the world community you know, to uh, share the vaccines. So as you know, um, Dr. Fauci mentioned, um, you know, early uh, January last year, uh, we um, did the whole genome sequencing from four organizations in parallel to make sure we got the correct one. So China CDC, China Academy of Medical Sciences, Institute of Virology, Chinese, uh, Academy, uh, Chinese Academy of Sciences, and also Hubei Provincial CDC. So by, by the end, we got, you know, what it is. Uh, on the 10th, the sequence was uh, put on the PSAT. So actually we used this sharing, um, you know, early like eighth or ninth, because it's, we need to verify all this sequence there. So we get authentic, complete genome sequencing available in GSAT on the 10th, and also share the WHO. Uh, you know, so we also, you know, me and uh, Dr. Chen Wang, we wrote something to warn for the global concern early January, together with Peter Hobby from Oxford and Fred Hede from uh, Virginia. 
So this is you know, where we are at the moment at, at that time from the very beginning. So now where we are in China, as you know, in China, we did a good job with the containment in Wuhan. This is the um, um, cases in Wuhan uh, by, the, by early April and it down to the zero. But uh, early um, May, we have a dozen of uh, re such researched um, cases, but that is gone. So original viruses appeared in Wuhan that disappeared. Then we have with this uh, yellow column, we have so many imported cases. So this is the imported cases. And mainly that, this, this one, mainly from the um, northeastern um, province of Heilongjiang and Jilin. After that, we have local transmission, the imported virus with the local transmission. Then blah, blah, and then here you have something in Beijing. In general, we have, you know, many, many uh, cases for last year. We calculated roughly, you are talking about 20 bigger one with another 20 smaller one. You are talking about roughly about 40 is um, sporadic outbreak with these imported cases. But we did the sequencing. We can really recognize you know, where the virus you know, came from. So this is exactly where we are in China. Because in China, the virus is well controlled. We don't have any uh, variants. We have something, but they are all imported, including the V1 and V2. They are all imported. So the situation for the vaccination at the moment in China, uh, as I mentioned, you know, because we have uh, uh, a lot of uh, pressure uh, because of out, uh, 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 imported cases. Um, in China, by doing the lockdown in Wuhan, and then after that, small, in a very small level of lockdown plus, mainly suppression, you know, plus, you know, plus the three Ws, Dr. Fauci proposed, I call the three bigs, wearing a mask, and, uh, watching the distance and washing your hands, all this, you know, we, we did, anyway, then we did everything good, right. And then of course you cannot really rely on the NPIs forever. This is why in China, we also put a great effort on the vaccine development. You know, from the very beginning, we put, because the, think about the condition in China, in China CDC, we have 14 BSR3 um, labs. So we convert four of them into a workshop. So two companies were united together with the China CDC. We developed two lines of the United vaccines. Another line is in Wuhan, Wuhan Institute of Virology, Chinese Academy of Sciences. They also convert, converted their BSR3 lab into a workshop. So this is why China chose the United vaccine. We did it by the end of January last year and early February. So we chose the seed virus, you know, got everything right. So this is why in China, the United vaccine moves a little bit quicker. So in China, the organization of the vaccine, R&D, so we have a so-called state control joint preventative vaccine. There, we have a vaccine R&D special team uh, of the scientific research group. It's a kind of, a, that kind of, a kind of a watchdogs who make sure the companies and uh, their research institute, they are doing the right thing. And also we are, we put up something like the multi-ministries collaboration on the vaccination. So China CDC is doing a lot of te technological support. Of course, one of them is inactivated vaccines. We actively evolved, you know, for the um, supply for the BSR3 labs there. So, so this is the landscape for the candidate vaccine globally. So everybody knows that already. What I want to see, this is the figure I use my, with my colleague with this paper published uh, nature reviews immunology. So we summarize, we have seven lines of vaccine in the world, roughly inactivated, live, and uh, recombinant protein, vector, virus vector, um, and then you, uh, uh, then live, virus uh, live particles and virus vector, you could do influenza virus and adeno. We have a candidate um, vaccine in phase one and two in China with the influenza vector. We, we just approved for the traditional commercial use for the adenovirus vector vaccine. So, so far in China, we have four vaccines in traditional 
commercial use because we haven't got the phase three clinical trials and point data. So we cannot have it approved formally. So we, that, this is why we call this a conditional commercial use. And because we haven't got the end point, so this is why we cannot put the, all the data in the open um, uh, uh, to the professionals. We, but of course, we have Utertream data. So this is why we decided to have this. We also have mRNA vaccine, ideal vaccine under development. So this is the uh, 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 vaccine doses administered until February 8th in the whole world. You know, here is the China. But today, we have left briefly um, 50 million um, people vaccinated in China at the moment. Some with the, uh, the first uh, injection, the other, you know, we still have one third with the second injection. In China, we still have a long way for the vaccination. So this is a, a message in China, I already mentioned for this, adenovirus vector, that's approved today. Next the vaccine, we have uh, three at the moment now, and that of the recombinant uh, subunit vaccine, this actually developed in my group by the tandem repeat uh, dimeric uh, RBD. So this one in phase three clinical trials. And then nucleic acid in phase one and two, attended to influenza virus also in phase one and two clinical So this is the five platforms with uh, four two vaccine in China's house. I mentioned here already. You give you a very good example to inactivate it. non replicative viral vectors, adenovirus type five, and uh, I mentioned already here, uh, protein subunit, uh, mRNA, DNA, we all have a DNA vaccine, in, uh, one and two uh, phase trials. And of course, we, you, uh, you could are influenza virus based. Uh, this is a very good example with the uh, United vaccine developed in, uh, in China. It collaborates with the China CDC. I'll give you an example, it's virus cell based. This one is a popular use at the moment. Um, and also, you know, this is something to give you some data quickly, have a quick look. You know, these are the data, the interim data. Of course, this one is the phase two data. It's very clean, it's worked very well, you know, for the antibody conversion, it's very good. But the phase three clinical trials, we are still waiting for that. So the vaccine NASA program, progress, let's give an example with this the conference, uh, press conference in China. So we tried to, Make sure we don't have the euphodemic, like uh, uh, Dr. Tony Fauci mentioned about the uh, uh, vaccine, vaccine uh, hesitancy. So we came to this press conference. Uh, vaccine is approved by, you know, we initiated in July, and by December 15, we have the, we try to also target the key populations, like Dr. Tony Fauci mentioned about this. So this, we, you know, followed everything under the WHO's proposal. So AEA5 civilians, because we haven't got a formally approved vaccine. So AEA5 service is very important. This is our very, looks very complicated, complicated uh, service system. But most importantly, what I want to see here, the whole system here, the data so far, uh, we haven't got anything. The AEA5 is more than what we got for the uh, influenza virus. So, that's really good, good news. So I will uh, you know, go through this very quickly. The AEF, AVFI surveillance, um, uh, what I want to say, I already mentioned about this, you know, it's rich, it's compared with the influenza, it's not no, it was well, slightly higher, but very similar. So this is you know, a very general conclusion in China at the moment. So we joined COVAX, um, for the WHO, I hope, so we will um, contribute to something, also assist for the low-income countries um, for the vaccine development. As you already see some news, some of our companies already donated um, some vaccine to the developing countries. Thank you. Um, I would be ready to take some questions after this um, presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gao, for sharing with us the details on the progress uh, in, of vaccines in China. And of course, congratulations for all your success in controlling uh, the epidemic in your country. I'm going to move on to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Catherine Jensen. Welcome. And uh, Dr. Jensen is the Senior Vice President and Head of Vaccine uh, Research and Development at Pfizer. 
and a member of Pfizer's worldwide research and development uh, team. And she's been working in the area of uh, vaccine development and has uh, and uh, manages a, a large portfolio of uh, uh, clinical vaccines that include vaccines for prevention of uh, uh, pneumococcal pneumonia, Clostridium difficile, respiratory syncytial virus, uh, B strep, Lyme disease, and of course, SARS CoV 2. Uh, we are looking forward to your presentation on the industry's perspective on vaccine development. Welcome. Yeah, thank you very much, Vefa, uh, for the uh, nice introduction, as well as the opportunity to participate in this uh, great conference. So, uh, hello, everyone. Um, if I could have the, uh, the next slide, please. Over a year ago, um, as we heard, the first case of COVID-19 was reported in Wuhan, China, and a sequence of the culprit, SARS-CoV-2, was made available shortly thereafter. But as two days ago, COVID-19 has uh, already caused over 112 million uh, confirmed cases of COVID-19 and over 2.4 million deaths. Not to mention, of course, the huge detrimental economic and societal impact that disease is leaving in its track. Uh, could I go to the prior slide, please? So even before the pandemic was declared by the WHO, I think it became clear to many in the field of um, vaccine R&D um, that the best way to stem a potential pandemic is through the development of highly effective vaccines in addition, of course, to the development and deployment of other prevention strategies, such as um, infection control using mask wearing and social distancing. If I could go to the next slide. Next slide, please. So this schematic uh, shows the remarkable journey that um, by our partners, BioNTech, uh, Pfizer, a wealth of academic company and government, government um, partners to develop a COVID-19 vaccine in record time. And as you can see, it took only nine months of development before our COVID-19 vaccine re um, received emergency use authorization initially in the UK, followed then very closely in the United States in December. And to just give you an idea, as of this February 2021, our vaccine is approved for emergency use in over 33 countries uh, globally, with over 112 million doses shipped as of two days ago, and more than 33 million doses already administered in the United States. We are on target also to deliver 2 billion plus doses um, at the end of uh, 2021. So on the next slide, I'd like to quickly, um, you know, talk about how this all could happen in such, uh, you know, uh, record sp uh, speed. So after extensive internal deliberation in the January timeframe, on which platform uh, we could best address uh, SARS-CoV-2, we chose uh, BioNTech's mRNA uh, vaccine platforms for a number of reasons. Uh, we know that uh, RNA vaccines are produced by cell-free Dr. Jensen, I can't hear you now. Uh, Dr. Jensen, we cannot hear you. It looks to me like uh, Dr. Jensen was disconnected for um, uh, for some reason, uh, maybe let's wait a minute, a minute or two. She probably lost connection to the internet. Uh, so we'll just hold on briefly.
maybe uh, while we're holding uh, for um, Dr. Jensen to attempt to reconnect, uh, we might want to move on to um, our next speaker and then we can come back uh, to Catherine's presentation. If we can stop sharing uh, this presentation. Thank you. And I'll now introduce our next speaker and hopefully we'll be able to get Catherine back online. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Richard Hatchett and he is the uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, CEPI. And this is a, a, a critical partnership of public, private, uh, philanthropic, and uh, civil organizations that support the development of vaccines uh, against very high priority um, health threats, like for example, uh, COVID-19, COVID obviously, and also to advance uh, technology platforms uh, to allow for development of, uh, of such vaccines in a, in a rapid manner. Um, Dr. Uh, Hatchett will be uh, presenting uh, to us next. Uh, Dr. Hatchett, if you uh, are going to share your slides. Sure, uh, let me attempt to do that. Um, Thank you very much for stepping in. <laughs> no, no problem. Um, can you see my slides? Yes, I can see them perfectly. Please go ahead. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Rafa. Thank you for the introduction and, and thanks to Columbia uh, for inviting me to participate in the presentation today. I'll give a, a, a brief presentation and, and uh, then hopefully we can ultimately have uh, Catherine back to hear the rest of her presentation, which uh, you know is really describing one of the most exciting new technologies I think any of us have ever seen in the field of vaccinology. I'm going to talk very briefly about CEPI's experience uh, and, and our perspective on global commitments, uh, particularly to equitable access to these amazing vaccine products that we now have. Uh, let's see. So I'll, I'll talk uh, first about our response to COVID. Uh, Wafa, thank you. You, you, you briefly um, described CEPI. If, if there are uh, folks watching who aren't familiar, with CEPI, uh, we are a global coalition composed of public, private, philanthropic, and civil society organizations. We actually were brought together uh, in 2017. So we're a new organization, only about four years old. Our, our mission is to support the development of vaccines through public-private partnerships against emerging infectious diseases, and critically to ensure uh, access to those products for the people who need them without price being a barrier. Um, before COVID-19, we, we had worked on a number of known threats such as Ebola, loss of fever, Nipah, and importantly, MERS. We had invested uh, around $140 million in the, in the development of MERS vaccines and an additional $50 million in the development of rapid response platforms. And, and when COVID emerged, we were very, rapidly able to pivot those partners and others to help build out our portfolio. Uh, we had no money actually set aside uh, in an emergency response fund when COVID emerged. We were, we were fortunate though in that we were able to borrow an initial $100 million from ourselves essentially from funds that we had that were allocated to future expenses and other programs and were very rapidly able to raise substantial funding around $1.4 billion, of, of which we have now deployed about $1.3 billion to initiate the development of vaccines. I believe we may have been the first organization in the world to initiate vaccine development contracts. Um, we, we started our first three vaccine development contracts when there were 561 cases of COVID globally and, and 17 deaths. We have subsequently expanded our investments to include 11 different uh, partnerships, uh, nine of which are still viable. Uh, we believe this to be the largest vaccine portfolio globally. Um, we had focused in selecting our products, and I'll, I'll, I'll quickly show the um, portfolio in a minute, uh, on providing speed of, of development, uh, scale, the ability to scale those vaccines to uh, meet global needs, and uh, on securing access commitments. We have been uh, part of COVAX, I'll talk about it in a minute, um, and our goal through our investments and through COVAX are to provide at least 2 billion doses of vaccine for COVAX participants um, over the course of 2021. 
Uh, the goal of, of COVAX is to meet the challenge of the pandemic collectively uh, for the benefit of all, across all uh, income levels uh, of, of country. Our portfolio, uh, as I mentioned, we've actually now described it uh, as having a wave one component. These are vaccines that will provide doses uh, in 2021 uh, and a wave two component. Uh, you will see a number of companies that you recognize on the portfolio. We have made investments of different scales. Uh, the investment with Moderna uh, was very early, but it was uh, just a small investment catalytic to help them develop their clinical trial material, help them speed to clinical trials. We ranging from that very small investment up to the investment in Novavax of over $400 million. And for the larger investments that you see here, we have secured substantial access commitments to the COVAX facility. Um, we've invested, we deliberately diversified our investments to include different approaches to vaccine development, ranging from the nucleic acids to recombinant proteins, and viral vector vaccines. Um, and we also diversified the locations. The initial portfolio of nine vaccines, we had three companies that were based in the US, three in Europe, and three in the Asia Pacific region. Um, we have subsequently uh, added what we are calling wave two investments. These are uh, really next generation vaccines that will um, deliver doses first in 2022. Uh, or beyond. We have just initiated these programs, so the investments are small. Two of the projects that we will be funding uh, actually are, are still in due diligence, and we haven't named them publicly yet, so they're, they're not named here. But again, you can see the diversification of, of location and diversification of approach, which is, is quite deliberate. We've also focused in the wave two vaccine uh, candidates on products that will provide um, advantages in terms of use. So we're looking for vaccines that are heat stable. Uh, ideally, we would, um, you know, increase the number of one dose vaccines. Uh, we're, we're certainly, um, you know, think a one dose vaccine offers tremendous advantages, such as the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, um, and and we'll be, you know, advancing these further. Um, starting, we Steppi has played. Um, a variety of roles over the course of the pandemic. In the first couple of months, our focus was mainly on, on being an early funder, providing ignition funding to get vaccine development programs started as, as quickly as possible. Um, really for the last uh, eight or nine months, we have uh, since, since really since April, um, we have shifted our focus to ensuring global equitable access to vaccines. And we were one of the creators along with Gavi and with WHO of the COVAX, uh, which I think hopefully most people will have heard of. This is um, a large effort now involving 191 countries, the largest multilateral effort since the Paris Agreement um, to support the development of vaccine, the, the uh, manufacturing, procurement and delivery of, of uh, vaccines to all participants. And we have the large portfolio, and then we can also go out beyond the R&D portfolio that I've described to also purchase vaccines on the open market. Um, I'm delighted to say, I, I hope people saw this, that uh, yesterday, the first deliveries of vaccine from COVAX of the AstraZeneca vaccine uh, manufactured at Serum Institute of India arrived in Ghana, um, 600,000 doses. Um, there will be much, much more uh, in, in the way of vaccine deliveries uh, to participants in COVAX in, in coming weeks and months. Um, we'll talk uh, very quickly about what's next. Um, looking to the future, I, I, I think what we will see as we begin to emerge from the pandemic is a convergence of political will, a, a whole new array of vaccine technologies and a globally shared desire um, you know, really to say never again uh, in, in, in terms of, um, you know, allowing a pandemic to cause such damage to um, the world, to the economy, um, and, and obviously to people's lives and, and livelihoods. Um, we envision uh, increasing investment globally, both at national and regional levels, and uh, we see opportunities to coordinate those investments uh, into a greater global whole. So that the United States, which in the past has had to carry 
uh, much of the burden of medical countermeasure development can share that burden globally. Um, Dr. Fauci has already uh, shown uh, actually more elegant slides showing the, the speed of the development, but this is just showing the, the historical pace of vaccine development. You can see you know, what a step change, what a quantum leap COVID-19 uh, vaccine development presented. Um, really 300 days from uh, sequences to the first Pfizer data uh, that I'm sure Catherine was going to show us. Uh, that is astounding, you know, much faster than the four years of vaccine development that were, uh, was the previous record. 300 days, unfortunately, was still drastically too long, uh, obviously, um, and we need to shorten that. CEPI has articulated a moonshot goal of uh, shortening that time in the future to 100 days. Um, we have embraced Dr. Barney Graham's concept of the prototype pathogens, uh, looking across viral families known to cause human disease and to develop uh, vaccines and to work out the problems of vaccinology so that we are ready to respond to any new threat emerging from any viral family known to cause um, uh, human disease. And, and we'll be making significant investments in that space in coming years. And as I said, we, we do think there will be a, a post-pandemic consensus uh, around addressing such threats in the future and that it will be critically important uh, you know, for CEPI to be part of that conversation and to where we can to help coordinate efforts in advance, um, you know, goals for global preparedness. I'll just finish up um, with uh, this slide, which shows if if we had achieved, um, you know, the hundred day target this time around, where we would have been when vaccines began to roll out. Uh, the, the black lines uh, at the 70 million, 1.6 million represents what we actually achieved in 2020 and the lines below what we could have achieved if we had been able to uh, develop vaccines within 100 days. I'll stop there. Thanks, Wapa. Thank you very much. This is really very, very useful information and congratulations on that uh, very first shipment to Ghana. Quite a milestone. Uh, let's move back and uh, we have time constraints at this point, so I urge everyone to try as much as possible to uh, stick to the time frame. But, uh, uh, Catherine, can you, uh, uh, we'd love if you're able to share your slides again and continue your presentation where you left off. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I think we can go to the next uh, next slide. Um, so when we started out our COVID-19 uh, partnership with BioNTech, we had the choice of four different RNA uh, platforms. And while the vaccine target, the viral S protein, uh, was the obvious choice based on the decade-long experience on other coronavirus that um, Dr. Fauci already alluded to. We were not sure which form of the RNA itself to use, neither did we know what the, the optimal um, RNA construct would be. But given the enormity of our mission, uh, clinical data were very important to us in deciding on the right candidates. So we actually evaluated all four uh, candidates in a phase uh, one a study to make real-time scientific decisions on which uh, candidate to move forward to. And so we had some expectations. We were looking for, with regard to safety, for the construct with the best tolerability profile. We wanted the broadest immunogenicity uh, profile. And also with regard to, to be able to, to um, have a rapid pandemic response, uh, we were really looking for a candidate that uh, could be uh, produced very uh, efficiently. And so using all of those criteria, we actually um, selected what we called BNT162B2, which contains a modified RNA platform that expresses a coding optimized full length prefusion stabilized uh, spike protein, uh, protein. If I could go to the next slide. So given the remarkable speed of um, development, um, we were quickly to, we we're very quick in, in starting a um, phase three uh, program, taking advantage of the design of a seamless phase one, two, three study. And so, um, as you can see here, we have now enrolled over 46,000 uh, participants globally. Um, with and without stable chronic conditions. Uh, they uh, in, include diverse backgrounds, minority groups such as Asians, Blacks, Hispanic, Latino, and Native Americans. And we also have extended our uh, age range to lower ages uh, down to 12 years of age. 
the two primary efficacy endpoints um, covered by participants with and without um, evidence of infection prior to uh, vaccination uh, shown here, and we met both of these endpoints. So on the next slide, um, shown is actually the final F vaccine efficacy evaluation uh, against COVID-19 occurring seven days after those two in 170 cases without evidence of prior infection. This was a data cutoff of November 14th, 2020. And as you can see on the table, in the table that the observed efficacy was really very high at 95%. So while our trial was not powered to evaluate efficacy based on subgroups, uh, based on age, gender, racial, or ethnic group, you can see nevertheless on the table on the right that the observed efficacies was very high regardless of age or ethnic or racial group. So really consistent with the overall results. The curve on the left shows the cumulative incidence of all available COVID-19 cases beginning after dose one, placebo cases are in red and vaccine cases in blue. And what you can see is that after 14 days already, the curves began to spread indicating some efficacy after the first dose. And in fact, when analyzing the data post dose one, we did observe already an efficacy of over 90% um, after two weeks after the first dose up to the time when we delivered the second dose. So if I could have the next slide, please. So as I mentioned earlier, Pfizer is on track to produce at least 2 billion doses in 2021. And what's shown here is that um, we have already uh, dosed uh, over three, 33 million uh, individuals in the United States uh, alone. Now, we are continuously monitoring the efficacy and the safety of the vaccine through our ph pharmacovigilance safety reporting uh, program. And I'm very pleased to say that um, up to this date, uh, and according to the ACIP and our internal data, the safety profile that we have observed now immunizing uh, millions of individuals is pretty similar to what we have seen in the pre-authorization clinical trials. If I could go to the next slide, please. So just a couple of words, um, why we could pull this off so quickly. We are often asked this question, and I think it's important to understand that we changed our paradigm, how we're looking at vaccine R&D, going from a sequential approach to what I call a parallel approach, that even in the absence of preclinical or any early clinical data, an enormous effort was undertaken to essentially start the late stage development in parallel and scale up in manufacturing in parallel as those data were uh, coming in. We work closely with regulators, including the FDA, to design um, clever studies like the seamless, what I call one, the phase one, two, three study that started and essentially never stopped. It is still ongoing uh, to make real time decisions on um, on uh, you know what 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 to do next uh, and what the right approaches were, and of course we had the support from government agencies such as the CDC and others that provided us with a real time information of where the disease is, so that we could and uh, could make appropriate choices on um, on which sites actually our trial needed to be conducted. And certainly I like to say this at this point that we had the dedication of investigators and their staff and the motivation of trial participants that really allowed us um, to enroll the uh, ultimately over 46,000 uh, individuals um, in our phase three study. So if you go to the next uh, slide, just a couple of words of where we're going from here. So looking ahead, um, uh, I think it's it is clear from, from several uh, lines of evidence that the virus is here to stay, uh, so, is the, so is the disease. So on the right, you actually see a recent nature poll um, of over 100 uh, researchers and infectious disease specialists that have very clearly established that this, this is not going away and that we likely have to deal uh, with new variants that are already emerging. And uh, we need to assess uh, whether our vaccines are um, effective against um, these variants.
science. Now, a very, uh, just a couple of words to say that in, at least in, in data from that we are generated and that also generated in several other lab laboratories, the, the uh, virus variants that um, are of concern that have so far emerged, we still see either excellent real world evidence um, of protection with our vaccine and those data are coming out of Israel and also now coming out of the UK. And we also have evidence that the viral variants are very well neutralized uh, with our um, uh, vaccine induced immune serum. I think that's a really important uh, uh, factor, particular uh, uh, since we have seen even after single dose when individuals participants hardly had any neutralizing antibodies, some didn't have any. Uh, that we saw already um, a significant protection. So while we can see some decline in neutralizing antibodies against certain variants, I think it is really important uh, to, uh, to look at real world evidence data to make sure that we fully understand uh, what the effect is on potential uh, vaccine effectiveness and not taking um, making uh, uh, assumptions in, in this in this um, in this arena. So, if I could go to the next slide, uh, this is just uh, the summary of additional work that is upon us. I mentioned the uh, the variants. I mentioned um, uh, that we have to uh, potentially boost and address new variants, and this is being actively studied uh, clinically. Uh, we are working on um, new dosage uh, formulations uh, that would uh, reduce the, um, the requirement to store uh, the vaccine at um, ultra um, low temperatures. And I think it's really important, particularly if we want to finally get a grip uh, on this disease that we extend the vaccine to other vulnerable populations, for example, pediatric populations, to really ensure that we can get to a state of herd immunity as soon as possible. And finally, um, if we can go to the next slide, I really would like to uh, thank the, um, the many individuals and group that have supported us in this really historic and momentous achievement to provide uh, people with hope uh, amongst this uh, ter terrible um, situation that we have find ourselves in. And it could not have been possible um, without the input of all of those groups. And I just wanna say that I personally feel forever grateful for the involvement and the, um, the input and efforts of all of those individuals and groups. And with this, I'm, I'm done, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Jensen, for this excellent presentation. And uh, we'll move next to our last speaker, and then we'll have an opportunity for a discussion. And our last speaker is Dr. Sumya Swaminathan. And Dr. Swaminathan is the uh, WHO's first chief science scientist. Um, she's the first person to be named as such, and she started her tenure in March of 2019. Uh, she has long-standing experience as a researcher as well as also as an implementer and a policymaker uh, in her home country of India, where she's a recognized leader in terms of uh, HIV and tuberculosis uh, research. And I've had the honor of, uh, of working with Dr. Uh, uh, Swaminathan for many, many years. Um, I think what um, she's also been as well uh, involved in, uh, in a variety of different roles. Uh, in addition to her research, she's also been involved in a variety of different roles at a governmental level in terms of guiding uh, uh, policies uh, in, in India regarding uh, response to various infectious diseases. Uh, without further ado, a welcome, Sumya. Thank you very much, um, Vafa. I'm not being allowed to start my video. It says the organizers have, uh, have stopped it. So, Okay. Can we allow share screen? Yeah. Now. So thank okay. you very much for that introduction. I'm going to now share my screen. Um, and I hope you can see the slides. I'm just putting it on. Yes, um, it, just put it in the slide. Yes, it's perfect. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Thank you. A lot has been said uh, by all the eminent speakers before me. So what I will try and do is focus on where the WHO has been playing 
a major role. And of course, we've been coordinating and working with all of uh, the groups around the world. Um, I don't need to tell this audience that we have a, a unprecedented number of vaccine candidates in development, you know, several dozen in clinical trials already. Um, and we've heard about the science behind, uh, behind this. Um, of course, it's a challenge to do so many clinical trials. And uh, one of the challenges has been, I think, for some countries, Dr. Gao mentioned uh, the large number of vaccines being developed in China. But to do the large phase three efficacy trials to really get the clinical endpoints is, is a challenge. And that's where you know, countries that have controlled the, the uh, epidemic successfully may be at a disadvantage. Whereas in the US and in large parts of Europe, I think over the last few months, we've had so many cases. Epidemiology has, has actually helped the clinical trials you know, accrue their endpoints very quickly. That's just one of the things we need to think about for the future is how do we plan for clinical trials to be flexible and adaptable and agile so that even if the disease is you know, going down in one part of the world, you can do it in other parts of the world. And that's an approach we took for the solidarity therapeutics trials and hopefully could do the same for vaccines uh, as well. Again, just um, a fact check on the, you know, it's been about a little over two months now since uh, some countries started vaccinating their populations. You can see in this world map that there's quite a lot of inequity here from the over 220 million doses that have been administered so far worldwide, over 80% are in just 10, 10 countries. And um, again, distribution of countries is mostly the high income and the upper middle income countries that have started vaccinating. But that's why COVAX was, uh, was set up uh, as part of the ACT Accelerator. As you know, this was a partnership that was launched in April. Uh, it was basically structured uh, to both drive R&D and accelerate the development of new tools, but also to, uh, to ensure equitable distribution of those new tools, whether they're diagnostics or vaccines or therapeutics, once they're developed. And you can see all the partners uh, that came together along with several heads of state, states and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Wellcome Trust uh, and so on with very ambitious goals of, of getting over 2 billion doses of vaccines out in 2021 and similarly large uh, ambitious goals for therapeutics and diagnostics. Unfortunately, we haven't had that much success with therapeutics uh, except for dexamethasone, which is the only drug that's really been shown to reduce mortality uh, you know, we're still we're still trying to get more specific uh, antivirals or anti-inflammatory or immunomodulators. I think diagnostics, there's been a lot of progress, especially with the rapid diagnostic tests, uh, including many self-tests and paper-based tests that now are widely available. Um, so again, the objectives of COVAX, which is a vaccine spiller of the ACT Accelerator, was really to bring an end to the acute phase of the pandemic by the end of 2021 by sort of at least reducing or preventing all preventable deaths. Um, and, to, and doing that by supporting an actively managed portfolio of vaccine candidates that Richard has talked about and that CEPI has been driving. Uh, but main role of uh, the COVAX here is really to guarantee fair and equitable access. And this is because historically we know that there's been a long time between uh, a product being developed and a product actually getting to people who need them in low and lower middle income countries. And there are many, many examples, including HIV AIDS, including the hepatitis B vaccine, including some of the influenza pandemic vaccines. And so we didn't want that to happen again. And so this was a preemptive um, mode. Now, looking at 2021, I think Catherine, towards the end of her talk, was talking about uh, the variants. And, and so one of WHO's uh, functions, uh, normative functions, is to bring people together, experts from around the world. In fact, our first global forum, research forum on COVID-19 was before it was even had the name of COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2, was in Geneva on the 11th and 12th of February in, in 2020, which laid out a research roadmap. Now that needs to be revised now because of everything we've learned about uh, the virus and its epidemiology and clinical features. So we're reconvening all the expert groups and recently reconvened the groups that have been looking at vaccines uh, at, at, as well as at variants 
uh, and looking at uh, also trial methodologies and other kinds of, um, of innovative designs because the issue is again, once you have many vaccines that are out there, how do you uh, still continue to do randomized double blind placebo control trials? That's clearly going to become more and more difficult and therefore there's a need to look at other trial designs which can uh, still uh, provide the clinical endpoints that, that one needs. So some of the priorities that, that came out were really in three buckets, addressing the knowledge gaps, monitoring the impact of new COVID-19 variants on vaccine efficacy, and really speeding up the search for additional vaccines uh, for all countries. On um, the knowledge gaps for vaccines that are already being deployed or in late stage of clinical uh, development, we, uh, can, this group that we convened decided to, to create a repository of trial protocols, methodologies, and templates of all types of uh, research studies, both randomized trials and observational studies that would look at you know, all of the questions that still need to be answered, the duration of protection, uh, characterizing the immune response, trying to develop the correlates of protection, um, additional safety assessments. Many of these um, studies have been done in relatively small numbers, not all have done very large trials. So we still need to continue much more data as we, um, as we are seeing now, the real world effectiveness studies that are now trying, starting to get reported. Impact of variants. So again, the WHO setting up a system which will uh, serve to uh, harmonize and coordinate the global response to variants. So you need epidemiology, you need the laboratory data, we need the correlations between the variants and the clinical, as well as the, um, the transmission dynamics. We need the, uh, the research on the animal models, et cetera. And then of course, we need to test the new vaccines that will be developed either monovalent or multivalent vaccines with, uh, with the new um, mutations incorporated in them. And so we are setting up this, this committee, this global advisory committee that will then coordinate with all of these other different uh, streams of work and come together to basically uh, look at the data, look at the evidence and take a call on when a, a particular region or a country needs to really start thinking about not using a vaccine or, he, or, or needing a different vaccine, as well as when um, there should be new vaccines being developed and along the lines of influenza or learning from influenza, but not exactly on the, the same model is really advising developers and manufacturers on the variants of concern that would need to be incorporated. And the first thing we, we are doing is to defining what is a variant of interest and what's a variant of concern. And this definitions I think should be up on our website today or tomorrow so that everyone around the world understands how you define these and what studies are needed. And also a nomenclature which avoids stigmatizing countries where uh, these variants were first discovered or described. And then you need to, we still need to continue the search for additional effective vaccines because we need billions of these doses. We might need to continue to, to need uh, booster doses for the future. So we, there's really uh, still a need to invest in technologies which are easy to use, which are affordable, which are scalable, which can be easily produced at scale and uh, uh, which you know, can be actually manufactured uh, around the world in a, in a more distributed fashion. Because one of the things we have difficulties and challenges we're facing today is that there are, you know, difficulties with supply chains, as well as countries that are preventing the exports of vaccines across their own national borders, resulting in um, unequal, unequal uh, distribution. So again, there are a number of normative uh, issues here that, that need to be uh, addressed around the standards, uh, around defining the correlates of protection and so on. And that's what WHO's role really is in all of this work. So right from the beginning, we've, as I mentioned, we had the Global Research Forum in February. We've been maintaining a landscape of COVID candidate vaccines. There are criteria for prioritizing candidates and there's a committee actually that advises us on which candidates to take into uh, further trials. We developed target product profiles for vaccines which played an important role really in also informing regulatory guidance for 
uh, which vaccines would actually meet the, these benchmarks. The 50% minimum efficacy came from this target product profile. We've convened a large number of groups around assays, around animal models, also human challenge studies. So we've been convening groups and Dr. Plotkin has been part of uh, those discussions um, with the UK, the Netherlands and others who want to proceed with human challenge studies. And our bioethics working group actually came out with a very nice framework on the ethical considerations for conducting human challenge studies. And then of course, we, we continue to look beyond introduction of the vaccine uh, through our uh, post, um, post um, introduction safety and other um, surveillance. On the country uh, deployment side, uh, we've spoken mostly about the R&D and we have to recognize that a vaccine is of no use until you vaccinate people. And we've seen even in high income countries, the challenges of doing that at this kind of a scale. Most countries do not have large adult vaccination programs. And therefore in late last year, we developed a guidance for countries that uh, basically go through what uh, steps, actions would be needed at the country level from regulatory issues to you know, delivery strategies to identifying target populations, supply chain, vaccine safety monitoring, the data monitoring systems, et cetera, so that countries could start preparing. The other important uh, normative work of WHO is the SAGE, which is a strategic advisory group of experts on immunization. They started uh, discussing in the, in the middle of last year. Uh, the, the first thing they came out with in September was a values framework that would inform the allocation and prioritization of vaccines. And then a prioritization um, uh, document in November, a roadmap which actually talks about what do you do when you have limited supplies and depending on the epidemiological situation a particular country is in, how would you prioritize uh, populations? And then the SAGE then started making recommendations for individual vaccines as they came out. And of course, we need to see all the data, the companies come and present to the SAGE working group. So on the 5th of January, we had the guidelines for Pfizer. Uh, soon after that, the Moderna and then the AstraZeneca vaccine on the 8th. And we're now uh, discussing the j, &J vaccine, the Sinopharm, and then followed uh, possibly by um, Sinovac, as well as the uh, Novavax uh, uh, vaccine. So, so that's an important, I haven't gone into the details of the regulatory, but similar to the SAGE guidance, we've had our regulatory uh, uh, and pre-qualification team examining dossiers for emergency use license. We opened the expressions of interest in October last year, and then we've been receiving rolling submissions from at least 13 or 14 manufacturers. And we've so far uh, listed emergency use, listed Pfizer as well as the AstraZeneca uh, from two uh, manufacturers, the Serum Institute of India and the AstraZeneca SK Bio uh, facility, the Republic of Korea. We're looking now at, uh, at the emergency use listing process for Moderna. And again, the others are uh, in, in, uh, in line being looked at because the emergency use listing that WHO provides is very useful for countries uh, which either don't have a strong regulatory authority or you know, to save time, uh, countries can just accept the EUL provided by WHO and that becomes their regulatory authorization so that you can then get uh, vaccines into countries very quickly. So again, there's a huge challenge between actually the upstream, uh, the development of the vaccines, manufacturing it at scale, getting it you know, uh, sent, shipped to countries, the, all the logistics of that, making sure that you have the syringes, the needles, the PPE for the healthcare workers, and then in many countries, there's a shortage of healthcare workers. There's countries are in debt otherwise, their economy is in ruin. So just finding the financing to get these large uh, immunization campaigns uh, going is, is a huge challenge. And um, Richard showed a photograph of this first supplies from the COVAX facility actually landing in Ghana yesterday. So the, so the supply started and over the next couple of weeks, we should start seeing dozens of countries getting their supplies from COVAX, smaller volumes to begin with, but hopefully as we get more supplies from the manufacturers and more vaccines coming in, uh, the j, j the Novavax, all of them have supply agreements with COVAX, we should start increasing supplies to get to that 2.1 billion doses that we wanna get to. Uh, that's a floor, that's the minimum. We would like to do much more than that. 
if we're able to. So again, the challenges continue. We need uh, to think about tech transfer, particularly with these mRNA technologies, which have really proved themselves uh, in this pandemic. Um, but there are very few places where these are being manufactured. More clinical trials are needed, as I already talked about, and, and then the coordinated uh, global system to address the, the variants. And these are just some of the challenges. Potentially, we will see many more as, uh, as, as we go ahead in the next couple of weeks. So I will stop there, hand it back to you, Rafa. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much and appreciate um, all the speakers and all your insights. And um, I'd um, like to maybe now move to our discussion and, um, and conversation with all of our speakers. Um, uh, maybe I'll start by um, uh, by uh, thinking about you know the, there are there's a cascade of events when we think about vaccines that uh, goes all the way from R and D to actually supplying sufficient the supply and the distribution of the vaccines, and then uh, of course uh, uh, the willingness of the population to get vaccinated. And I th I think there are challenges at each of these steps in that cascade. And maybe I'll start with the last part of the cascade and, and uh, talk a bit about some of the, uh, maybe I'll ask, um, uh, maybe Sumia can talk to that as well as others if you wanna talk to, uh, what are the efforts that are being made to overcome uh, some of the issues around confidence in vaccines and vaccine uh, hesitancy? And, and are there partnerships that are developing between the, um, the pr private sector as well as um, as in the private sector, as well as governmental entities and, and, uh, and WHO, for example, uh, to try to build confidence in the vaccines. Um, so maybe I'll start with you, Sumia, because ultimately, as you said, what matters is really getting people to agree to be vaccinated and want to be vaccinated. Yes, yeah, so, you know, early uh, in the course of this pandemic, uh, the Director General actually talked about an infodemic side by side mm -hmm. with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And it was clear that right from the beginning, there was so much of misinformation out there. Um, and vaccine, uh, anti-vaccine uh, messaging and so on had started even before there were effective vaccines that had been developed. So it was incredible that there were people out there already uh, who were spreading anti-vaccine messages. So the WHO really stepped up, I think, its communication uh, to... Uh, using all sorts of different uh, platforms, social media platforms, direct communication to people through, uh, you know, uh, Facebook lives, um, the member state briefings, the press briefings that were initially every day, and then we started doing it three times a week. So trying to be as open and transparent as possible and providing facts. The other thing we did was to work with some of the big tech companies to do two things. First of all, to promote credible information so that if somebody goes on to Google and puts in a search for COVID vaccines, they should be directed to credible sites, whether it's a government site or a CDC or a WHO, and not off to some other you know, vaccine misinformation site. And the second was that, that, any, that if we highlighted to any of these tech companies, there were false and misleading information that that would be taken down immediately. And this has really worked well. I must say that all of the platforms, particularly the social media platforms, have worked closely with us over the last several months uh, to do this. Mm -hmm. The other thing, of course, we do is to work with our uh, partners in countries, the member states, and then provide, mm -hmm. uh, provide the uh, information, the technical information to them based on which they can then yeah. go out and, and communicate with the public. But I think it's Mm -hmm. I must say that the surveys uh, that have shown increasing acceptance of vaccines, I think in most countries, it, it seems to be going up as more mm -hmm. vaccines are being rolled out with a good safety profile. But mm -hmm. there are a few countries, particularly in Europe, where vaccine hesitancy is extremely high. Mm -hmm. And in, in, this really needs to be addressed. And as you said, I think you need all partners coming together to do this. Well, thank you. That's, um, that's really important. It's kind of interesting also in looking at the timeline that you showed um, I think uh, that Dr. Fauci showed, and I think also you showed as well, Richard, and, uh, the rapidity, and, and also Catherine, the rapidity and uh, of development of vaccines uh, is, is noteworthy and fantastic. And uh, ironically, one of the most common questions I get asked uh, in multitudes of webinars is uh, people are uh, uh, 
you know, mistrustful because it was developed so fast. It's kind of ironic, isn't it? Um, and I, I guess I feel like, I don't know what your comments are, but I feel like we need to change almost the expectations uh, that based on the experience with this vaccine, hopefully um, there will be the expectation that other vaccines won't take as long. Uh, but I wonder if you have had to tackle this, uh, Richard, in terms of uh, this issue of, uh, of, uh, of actually worried, uh, people who are worried because of the rapidity of the development of these vaccines. No, no, thanks, Wafa. I, I absolutely. I mean, I, I think it is e even under ordinary circumstances, and these were far from ordinary circumstances. I, I think the rapidity would raise questions about, you know, surely you must be cutting corners if, if you tell me that vaccine development takes five years or a decade, and now you're doing it in less than twelve months. Surely you must be cutting corners. And we, you know, all through the year, and I'm sure Catherine. Um, you know, was very much in the same boat. I mean, I mean, the way we accelerated vaccine development was by taking financial risks mm -hmm. and by doing things in parallel um, rather than by taking risks with either safety or efficacy. Mm -hmm. and, and just the speed alone would have raised questions. I, I think it's fair to say even legitimate questions from, you know, people about, you know, how did you do this so fast? When, when, you, when you superimpose that rapid development over what became you know, a, a, a very divided populace about how the responses to the pandemic were being managed, a very distrustful population that was already polarized um, you know, before that, um, I think it creates a, a perfect storm of, of conditions in, in which distrust and authority goes up and, and as Heidi Larson, as many of you will know, has shown, you know, the, the best barometer for vaccine hesitancy is, you know, people's trust in the authorities who are trying to get them to take vaccines. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're probably at an all time low in, in that regard, unfortunately. Yeah, it's interesting. Thank you. And, and maybe, um, I, I actually, I, I always think uh, or I'm thinking now that in the future we should, uh, not ask how come it was developed so fast, but rather how come it's taking so long <laughs> to develop vaccines? And maybe this will uh, uh, enable us to uh, move quickly in terms of the universal corona vaccine and other ideas that uh, you've all been talking about. Another yeah, well, if, I, if I may to just add a, a comment to uh, the, the hesitancy and the mistrust, I think what we also have done, because we realized that very early in the development of the program, as, as we have seen, that the uh, vaccine manufacturers, um, you know, very quickly opened up, uh, you know, the protocols, you know, how, how things were done in a very, very transparent manner that I would say, uh, was also unprecedented because, you know, we, we wanted to make sure that everyone saw that the activities and, and what it takes to, to, to bring those uh, vaccines over the finish line were done exactly the same way as we always do them. And so that uh, there was a deep insight from, from the public uh, and whoever wanted to have more information to to really look at the, the processes and everything and, and make up their own minds, um, uh, but having factual information. So I think that also mm -hmm. has helped, uh, but of course it hasn't fully uh, addressed the whole program, um, the problem, but I think it has helped. Yeah, I think you're right, absolutely. I think the transparency, like for example, what George said in posting the, you know, the virus uh, uh, immediately or rapidly and uh, the pharmaceutical companies posting their protocols and so on. I think that's been incredibly useful. Uh, another um, issue that I think is, is, is interesting is that of course this disease has affected the uh, high income countries substantially. I mean, if you think about the countries like the United States or Western Europe, uh, in many ways that contributed probably the largest numbers of, of cases. And that kind of raises the, the issue of um, equity, public health, uh, self-interest, uh, particularly as we're focusing on global access um, to a vaccine. Um, so I'm just curious, and maybe, um, uh, maybe uh, George, you can comment on, uh, you know, how does a country prioritize and, and balance self-interest in terms of vaccinating its own population, uh, while at the same time, uh, if it's a privileged country that has resources, 
the importance of committing to a global coverage, the, the global responsibility. George, you have any thoughts on this? Uh, yes, um, you know, it's always a very good question for the global sharing and gl global co coverage. Uh, I, even when you think about China, we have one quarter billion people. Yes. Uh, even inside China itself, you know, it's a uh, broader coverage, also an issue, and who should go first? Uh, we have been also discussing about this even in China. Um, you know, I think uh, uh, COVAX is a good idea. The Soviets here. So we need to really need a kind of a coordination work. So in my opinion, coordination is very, very important. So we should encourage WHO to play a very important role. Um, you know, at the moment, um, the product um, coverage, um, are you, you know, because we don't have many uh, producers at the moment. That's the limitation. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, for example, from the very beginning, and in a lot of countries, they only have one or two producer or companies. They are interested, they have an interest. But in China, the situation is different. Of course, we have more uh, companies and you know, so many companies are involved. But the problem is because we didn't have any more cases. Uh, it's clean. We couldn't do any phase three clinical trials. Then everything is slowed down. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe you know, we need a kind of uh, WHO coordination for the phase three clinical trials, and then we'll have a broader coverage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, mm -hmm. it's a very complicated um, question. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And it, you know, in, in in some ways, it is also about uh, kind of um, uh, how do you bring the, the populations of various countries to a realization that it is in their self interest to have a to have really everybody protected, not just the citizens of one country. But that's a uh, that's a tough. Uh, that's a tough task uh, to accomplish. Um, and, and going back to you, uh, can I come in on that, Bapa, very quickly? Yeah. Yes, of course. So, yeah. So I think the arguments for protecting people around the world are three. One is, as you said, it's uh, it makes scientific and public health sense because if you have a lot of transmission going on in some parts of the world and a lot of variants and all of that happening it's going to come and threaten the rest of the world uh, eventually. Um, secondly, it makes a uh, moral and ethical, of course, mm -hmm. uh, argument that you want high-risk people everywhere to be protected because every life you know, has the same value regardless of the country that uh, the person lives in. And thirdly, there's an economic argument. There's been a lot of analysis done to show that uh, the economic losses that high-income countries will have to suffer as a result of global travel and trade not being able to open is also a very good argument. So it's not just the ethics and the morals, but there's an economic and a scientific argument for why uh, the available supplies. And as George said, the, quest, the real problem is that there's a, a shortage of supplies because we're expecting billions of doses to be manufactured suddenly, and that's not very easy. Mm -hmm. So if everyone agrees to share it, then you can ramp up coverage in all countries. Um, so that you cover the, you know, 10, 15% or 20% of the really vulnerable people before you then start covering your younger and healthier adults and so on. Absolutely. And, and I think you're right in that there are inequities between countries, but there also are inequities within countries. And we have to be uh, cautious and, and obviously as much as possible um, seek, um, seek good public health practice and, and equity within countries as well. I want to move to another topic, which is, um, as many of you are aware, we're, we're in a, I, I always say we're in a race between the virus and the vaccines. Um, so we have uh, fantastic vaccines thus far, but I think there's enormous concern, uh, palpable concern about the new variants. Uh, and already, particularly with the data uh, regarding some of the attenuation of efficacy in terms of the, uh, in, in the face of the, the variant identified in South Africa. So I'm just curious, uh, Richard and maybe Catherine, and uh, you can uh, comment on uh, that threat in of itself and how we can uh, uh, address it both in terms of the perceptions of the population as well as in terms of the science and development of new, uh, new vaccines. Maybe you can start, Richard. Sure, no, the, the variants, uh, to just build a little bit on, on Sumia's you know, three arguments for uh, 
sharing vaccines globally. I mean, it, it's, it is interesting that the, the emergence of the variant seems to have become the most compelling factor in the minds of many political leaders in, in high income countries about actually shifting their focus from just protecting their own populations to ending the pandemic globally, because they realize that as long as the pandemic is spreading, the, the variants will continue to spread. I, I mean, I think the, you know, I mean, we have sort of finger in the wind roughly estimated that we have compressed a, a decade's worth of technology development into the last 12 months. And, and we are emerging from this first year of the pandemic with a whole new arsenal mm -hmm. of tools. And, and, and certainly Pfizer and BioNTech led the way uh, both in terms of you know uh, uh, innovative clinical trial design and speed to delivering results, I was on a panel. Catherine probably saw this on a panel with Albert Borla um, recently, and um, you know espoused the goal of the hundred days you know to developing you know new vaccine candidates um, against the variants. And, and companies like Pfizer and Moderna are, are well on on the way to potentially being able. To meet that goal, we have the new FDA guidance from, from February 22nd describing what will be required for new variant uh, vaccines. It's very encouraging. I think they've taken a, a quite a flexible and risk-adjusted approach. So I'm, I'm optimistic that we will be able to respond um, quickly to adapt the tools that we have. The, the question, and this is really a question you know, that WHO is, is beginning to think about and will lead the way on, is you know given the, the the global emergence of different variants and different geographies, I mean they, many of them are converging on the same phenotype, but given that emergence, how how do we decide where to focus our efforts? And it, uh, and I think it's uh, I I attended part at least part of the WHO meeting that was pulled together about that and uh, and looking at also because it lends itself to. Uh, which again, what to focus on, but also what are the design of the studies uh, for the future uh, to answer those questions. Catherine, what about insights from your end? Yeah, this is a very, <laughs> this is a very uh, acute um, a question that you're asking here that is on, on everyone's mind for, for obvious reasons. And, and I really like to um, make two comments about this. I think, first of all, um, we have to be a little bit careful of how we describing the variants and what we know about the variants. Uh, because as we have seen uh, often that started with the UK variant, for example, where there was almost like a panic uh, of, you know, here's a variant and will the vaccines work? Um, that, uh, and then statements were made based on uh, you know, certain uh, laboratory data mm -hmm. where a laboratory result was uh, um, used as mm -hmm. an argument to talk about effectiveness and efficacy. Yeah. And I think we don't do ourselves any, any favors here because that, that is increasing the anxiety and it's actually not scientific uh, in my mm -hmm. mind. So I think what we need to do is, is um, using particularly laboratory data maybe as early warning signs to look deeply into what could be what I always call the variant, the nasty variant that comes along that all of a sudden um, vaccines don't work anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is more like a black and white scenario versus a scenario where there may be a variant that where you see laboratory data that would say, well, maybe it doesn't neutralize as well or whatever else data may appear, but this is not a black and white situation. It is not that all of a sudden, if you see, for example, uh, lower levels of neutralizing antibody, that then you say, oh, the vaccine is not working. Mm -hmm. But that's what's out there. That's how people talk about this, showing reduced effectiveness, efficacy, et cetera. Um, and so I think we have to be really careful uh, uh, in, in how we are dis, uh, describing this. Mm -hmm. And then the, the, the other piece, because nothing is worse than, than kind of fueling the fire because then folks may lose their heads, right? Rather than staying, okay, mm -hmm. what is the science telling us? Where are we getting the data from working together and making sure that we fully understand this? The other piece is, and Richard, you, you mentioned it, is um, really uh, ensuring ourselves and ensuring the public that we now have uh, demonstrated how quick we can make a vaccine de novo, 
much less um, that we also now know, know, know that to um, adapt a vaccine potentially can actually be done rather rapidly. And I think it is, and, and Richard, you mentioned it, I think it's great that the FDA came out very quickly with guidelines that allow um, manufacturers to very quickly demonstrate that they have a vaccine that could be rolled out. And I, what I see in the future that this will go even faster because right now it requires a, a clinical trial to demonstrate what we call non-inferiority. But we hope in the future that once we have established that one time, we don't have to do it again. And so it becomes more like a, like a routine update if required. Mm -hmm. And the third point I wanna make is, and I think that's probably the most difficult is, is there anything that one could do together working really globally that would give us, um, a, let's say again, a faster assessment of what ultimately would correlate with a, a lack of efficacy? And I'm talking black and white here because I don't think we're going necessarily to see this, but just reduced efficacy. Is there anything we can do and come up uh, with as a, as a community uh, to establish this, what I would call the true early warning systems that, oh yeah, here we have to be worried about this. And this variant could very well affect not just the efficacy of one of vaccines, but you know, could reduce it for, for, for all of the vaccines that, that are being out there. So this is, I guess, the, the, the three um, comments that I would make in, in, this, in this context. Well, this is uh, music to my ears because I think what you're saying is that we need both the laboratory science, but we also need the strong surveillance systems. Um, so we can essentially identify um, uh, when we are see, seeing a failure in terms of protection, uh, as well as, of course, continuing to seek uh, what are the markers of protection uh, through uh, laboratory science. As well as, I, I assume also um, there's the need for uh, you know, further um, expansion in terms of sequencing of, uh, of viral uh, isolates. And maybe as a last comment, uh, uh, George, we're running out of time. Uh, uh, but um, in terms of, uh, from your perspective as a virologist, immunologist, uh, you know, what would be two areas, two things that we should just keep an eye on in, term, in this whole area of the rising variants and potential compromise of vaccine uh, efficacy? I think we should address more in you know, a basic virology, tell the public and the professionals, because so far the virus, though you have so many mutations, but they still use the same uh, receptor to get into the cell. That tells you, you know, your vaccine will work. So, so far the data tells you, uh, though we have, uh, you know, the virus derived from South Africa, that's the V2. The V2 still, you know, so many vaccine tested, you could do two from China, inactivated, and the uh, protein-based vaccine, they still work, they, they are working very well for the neutralization because they are still using the same receptor mm -hmm. entry. Stop receptor entry, then you're in the business. So this is why, in my opinion, tell the people more about the basic virology. Thank you, that's my comment. Well, thank you very much, that's very helpful. Uh, I, I wanna end by offering everybody maybe a, a, the opportunity to just say in a few words, what. Where do you think we will be by the by the end of 2021? Are you optimistic? Are you um, semi-optimistic? Are you semi-pessimistic? <laughs> uh, just your, your thoughts in terms of this race between the virus and the vaccine. Maybe I'll start with you, uh, Sumya. I think I'm very optimistic because what I've seen in 2020 is that science has been, uh, you know, almost one step ahead. I would say. Uh, we've certainly kept up, and, and I think we understand the virus much better. We've, we've got excellent global working relationships, um, mm -hmm. lots of companies working on, uh, on newer vaccines, and I think we just need to continue in the same spirit, uh, both developing new products, but also making sure that they're getting to the people who need them. Thank you, Sumya. What about you? I'll, I'll join Sumya on the optimistic side. I, I think 2020, we saw terrific global solidarity uh, in the scientific community, tremendous achievements from industry. I think what we'll see in 2021, particularly as, as the high income countries uh, begin to be more comfortable that their populations are protected is, is, is global solidarity around the goal of ending the mm -hmm. pandemic. And I, 
I think we'll be well on our way by the end of 2021, hopefully out of the acute phase. Thank you. Uh, Catherine, what about you? Yeah, I would agree uh, with uh, the, uh, Richard and, um, uh, and Somia that I'm also in the optimistic uh, camp because we have very uh, efficacious vaccines. And um, uh, I think uh, we have systems in place to adapt, do we have to, if we need to, uh, very quickly. Um, so um, I would say, and also I would say that we have uh, the global community and, and the global science that is, has been working together and will continue to work together that I feel very um, optimistic that no matter what problem is thrown in our way, that uh, collectively uh, using sound scientific principles, we will overcome it. Thank you. And uh, George? Uh, in my opinion, I do agree. I'm very, also very optimistic. However, I do think we will get back the so-called as the normal we had before. Because we also got used to this uh, disease, this virus. So, because the PI strategy are there, because the key groups of the populace are vaccinated, because we are on the way for the development of the new vaccines. With all this, the disease will be under control, but it will not be uh, the same normal as we had before. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, George. And uh, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, uh, end by, uh, by reminding everyone that irrespective of whether you've been vaccinated or not, it is absolutely critical uh, to continue to observe the preventive measures, the non-pharmaceutical pre protective measures. Uh, they're more important now than ever, uh, particularly in view of these, uh, the continued transmission of the virus and the evolution of these new variants. So we need to stick to what we've been doing over the past year as we, as we look with optimism at the potential, uh, of course, benefits of a, of a, of a COVID-19 uh, vaccines. Um, I wanna end by thanking all of our speakers today. And Dr. Gao, thank you for being awake at 2 a.m. in Beijing to join us. And thanks, thanks to everyone else for your excellent inputs. I wanna also, of course, thank uh, the organizers of, uh, of this symposium and, uh, and uh, wish you all the best. Thank you and have a good day. Take care. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.